Hello everybody and welcome to our first module 14 exercise, the simple linear regression. I know it's far from simple the first time you see these, but there are a number of different regression methodologies and this is the simplest one. I know the first time you go through these, these can be overwhelming. There's a lot of different types of problems, a lot of different things that you might be, be asked to solve. I'll do my best to go through most of the common types of problems. There's no way that I can, I can put together videos for every single type of problem your instructor might ask you on regression analyses, but we'll try to cover off the most common ones. So again, regression analysis, it can be intimidating because there's a lot going on, but there's still some similarities with analysis that we've done so far. We're still working with a sample that we've drawn from a population. We're still estimating some unknown population parameters. Instead of sample means and proportions and standard deviations, now we're going to be estimating things like an intercept and things like a slope. We'll still be doing hypothesis testing. We'll still be doing confidence intervals. And of course, there's still going to be a whole bunch of interpretation. So. I'm going to go through what I've got here is a, a partial output from Excel using this very small data set. And we're going to go through, I'm going to split this problem up into a couple, maybe three videos because it can be a little bit time consuming and tedious. And we're going to go through and fill in this partial Excel output. Now, in theory, for a simple linear regression, you should be able to do everything from a data set. You should be able to fill out everything in this Excel output. I've given us a little bit uh, uh, of information to start with just to really accelerate the process. Again, you should be able to, to calculate these yourself, but it's a similar type of calculation as what you would have done in module 13, these sums of squared deviations. But in regression analysis, it's insanely time consuming. So I'm not going to ask that. I'm not going to go through um, that. But we'll see with a partial output like this, one of the tricks, in fact, the main trick is seeing what is it that we have to start with? What can I get with the ingredients that I have? And so We'll be piecing it together and that's how that's what I mean why every problem can be different because every problem you might start with different pieces of information and so the path that you take to completion is going to be different based on what little pieces of information you're given to start with. So here's what we're going to do. We'll go through this problem. Like I said, I'm going to split this into a couple of videos. We'll start off looking at the first couple of tables from this Excel output. The first one here are these regression statistics. This gives us a little bit of information about our sample, the standard error of the regression, and these measures of goodness of fit. And in this first video, we'll also go through this ANOVA. Very similar to module 13 ANOVA, but of course a little bit different because here we're dealing with regression. And then I'll do a, a separate video to go through this third table, which is really getting our estimated regression equation output. We'll have here our coefficients. So this will be B0 and B1. And then we'll get our standard error, our test statistics for the corresponding hypothesis test and intervals, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now <clears throat> let's get going. There's a strong belief, this is very similar to the introductory video if you watch the introductory video for this module. There's a strong belief that student performance is directly linked to the amount of time the student spends studying. In order to test this claim, here's our data. So here is our regression equation. I have as our dependent variable y, this is the student's grade, is somehow dependent on x. So I have reason to believe 
that I can better explain or better predict somebody's grade if I have information about how much this time they spend studying. Why? Well, because I have some reason to believe that these two variables are somehow correlated with one another, a positive correlation or a negative correlation. So if, in fact, these two variables are correlated with one another, then I will know that those students who have a higher uh, amount of time spent studying, well, my prediction for their grade is also going to be somewhat higher, right? So I can use that information about time spent studying, we say, to explain some of the variation in that grade. So the first thing that we're going to do is come down to our partial regression output and try to see, okay, based on what I've got, what can I get next? Where can I go from these ingredients? Well, here I can see I've got sum of squares due to regression and sum of squares total. Well, that sounds familiar, right? This is just like our module 13 analysis, but with different bits of information. Because here we have SST. That is the total variation that exists in our dependent variable. That's the total variation in my grade distribution. Now, I'm trying to explain, I'm trying to capture some of that variation. And I do that by incorporating different, more information. So if I have more information in this case, that more information is how much time they spend studying, then I'm hoping that that information will help explain the grade. In other words, as I said before, they'll be correlated. So I have some sum of squares due to regression, and that is the amount of the variation in my dependent variable that my independent variable can capture or can explain. But of course, there's random noise, right? There's always going to be some random deviation that I simply cannot predict or I cannot explain. So with this familiar relationship, well, now I can use that to calculate what is missing here. SSE. I have SST as 1644.8. If I subtract out of that 1301.62, well then what's left is my sum of squares error, 343.18. So that's that measure of random variation in my data set. Now, the next thing that I can do is get my degrees of freedom. The formulas for degrees of freedom and regression analysis, for us, they're not going to change. In module 13, you saw there were a few different calculations dependent on the type of ANOVA that you were doing, randomized block or completely randomized or factorial, right? There are a few different options. In regression, these formulas do not change. So for degrees of freedom to, for regression, this is going to be K minus 1 where K, I know when you're thinking in terms of ANOVAs, module 13, you're thinking treatments. Well, what are the treatments here? We don't really have treatments here. What K represents is the coefficients, the number of coefficients. So here I'm estimating two coefficients. So K is equal to two. So our degrees of freedom on regression is one. Degrees of freedom for error, this is going to be familiar, n minus k. Well, n is our sample size. How many observations do I have? I have five observations. I'm estimating two coefficients. So five minus two, I have three degrees of freedom for error. Total degrees of freedom. This is, as you might expect, n minus 1. I have five observations. 5 minus 1 is 4. And as you might recall from module 13, it's also the sum of everything above it. So I can see 4 is equal to 3 plus 1. Okay. Our mean squared. Same relationships as what you have seen from the previous material, module 13. It's the sums of squares divided by their degrees of freedom. So for this first one, degrees of freedom is 1. So our, our mean squared regression is 1301.62. 
our mean squared error is 343.18 divided by its degrees of freedom is 3, and that gives me 114.39. Okay, now I can get my F statistic. Well, that F, it's just what you might expect. Mean squares, oops, mean square regression over mean squared error. So it's just the ratio of those two mean squared values that we've obtained, 1301.62 divided by 114.39, and that gives me 11.38. There I have a corresponding p-value. Why don't we also get that critical value? Here I have one numerator and three denominator degrees of freedom. And we can do this at a 05 level of significance. Are you wondering what our test is? I haven't even written a test yet. We're just plugging through, filling out all these values. We'll get to that in just one second. So our F distribution, one numerator, three denominator degrees of freedom. So here I have one numerator and three denominator degrees of freedom. At alpha 0.05, that critical value is 10, let's round it, 10.13. So there's 10.13. So based on what you can see here, if we're doing this test at the 05 level of significance, you're going to reject the p-value is less than the level of significance. And our test statistic is greater than that critical F. We're going to reject based on the critical value. What are we testing? That's a pretty good question. The F test is a test for overall significance of the model. Now, for that to make sense, I need to sort of foreshadow to what module 15 is going to be about. Because in module 15, what we'll be looking at there is... A, a, a regression equation that has more than just one independent variable. It might have two, or it might have three, or as many independent variables as we want. So in that context, this F test as a test for the significance, the overall significance of the model, it would have a null and alternative hypothesis if this is what my regression equation looks like. I would have a null and alternative that says beta 1 is equal to beta 2 is equal to beta 3. They're all equal to 0. The alternative is that not all are 0. So this is what that looks like. Taking all of my independent variables together are they statistically significantly related to my dependent variable? Is there a relationship between my model and my dependent variable? All of my independent variables together and my dependent variable? Yes or no? Now, we don't have a model that looks like that. We don't have an x3. We don't have an x2. And so in this F test, I don't have a beta 3, I don't have a beta 2. So my F test for this simple linear regression is that is beta 1 equal to 0? The alternative, not all are 0. Well, there's only 1. So here, if there's only 1, I can actually rewrite that to just look like this. Is it equal to zero or not? Now, at this point, maybe that doesn't seem interesting at all to you, but that is exactly what the test is going to look like when we get down to this t-test on that individual parameter significance. So in a simple linear regression, the f-test and the t-test on the slope are identical. And there'll be a very clear relationship between the test statistics and the p-values. So this is that test for 
my F test. This is my null and alternative for the F test. Is the, is the model significant? Yes or no. My model here only consists of one independent variable. Now, just like the other F test that we did in module 13, this is an upper tail F test, which can be confusing because if you look at this, that sure does feel like a two tail test. I can see it's a test for equality but this is an analysis of variance. We are using these two estimates of the variance based on different bits of information, and we're testing to see is that one estimate st statistically significantly greater than the other. This is an upper tail F test for all the same reasons as we did an upper tail F test in module 13. Okay, so we've got that. We have our, our results. Here I have evidence to reject. And so here I can see we have evidence to support the alternative hypotheses. Yes, our model is significant. Okay, now, if I just take, what is the square root of 11? 0.38, that is 3.37. Okay, I'm just going to sit on that, and we'll come back to that. I'm not going to even explain what I just did. Let's just leave that there, and we'll see if it comes up anywhere. Okay, we have our ANOVA complete. We've done our, our Arpital F test for the model significance. We found that it's significant. Okay. Let's move on. Let's go fill out our, our regression statistics table and then we'll end this video and start another one for the um, estimated regression equation. So this first one, number of observations, well, that's pretty straightforward. Here I can see I have five observations, probably the easiest value in this table to fill out. That standard error, this is called the standard error of the regression. That standard error is the square root of MSE. So you can see here, given the information that we started with, I needed to, to go through in, in the order that I did because I needed to solve for this MSE first before I could solve for this. So you can see because of the starting point, because of the information that I was given at the beginning of this problem, there was a particular order that I had to go through. I had to get MSE first before I could get that standard error. And so you'll see that in all of these types of problems. Given what information you, you start with, the path to completion is always going to be different. So I have MSE. So if I just take the square root of MSE, 114.39, that gives me my MSE here of 10 points, about 10.7, if I rounded that. Okay, and now adjusted our square, I've put NA here, not applicable, only because the adjusted R square is really a tool that is used for multiple regressions. So that which I had written up here, if I have multiple independent variables, as we will have in module 15, the adjusted R squared is more relevant there. For a simple linear regression, it's not really useful, so I'm not going to bother discussing it here. We've got enough stuff going on in module 14. So what we do want is the R squared. The R squared, of course, this is SSR over SS. T. This is a measure of goodness of fit. How well does my regression equation or my chosen independent variables, or in this case, the amount of time somebody spent studying, how well does that explain the variation in my dependent variable, in this case, grade? This is really just a percentage. Here I can see SSR so the, the amount of variation that my independent variable captures, SSR, is 1301.62. The total variation in my dependent variable, SST, 
is 1644.8. So of the total variation in my dependent variable, my chosen independent variable captures 1301.62 divided by 1644.8. It captures 79% of the total variation in my dependent variable. So that R squared, we call it a measure of goodness of fit. How well does my model explain the variation in that dependent variable? So here I can say, I would say it's a fairly good fit. The R squared is somewhat subjective. A higher value is preferred over a lower value, but as we'll see in module 15, there are some complications there. But here I can see that my chosen independent variable captures 79% of the variation in Y. So the hours that people spend studying captures 79% of the variation in their grades. The last piece of this puzzle, the multiple R, this is the measure of linear correlation. Multiple R, this is just the square root of the R squared. In Excel, it's always going to be a positive value. So to complete this the way that it would look in Excel, I would just take the square root of the R squared, which is 0.89, and that's going to give me a measure of the strength of linear association. So this is just a pure measure of correlation. It's a correlation coefficient. So here this is giving me somewhat of an absolute value, 0.89. It's a very strong linear relationship. Whether it's positive or it's negative, well, that depends on this coefficient, which we don't have yet. The true measure, uh, a correlation coefficient, is really determined by the sign of what is on your slope added to the square root of the R squared. So for now, I don't know what that is. For now, I can see the multiple R is 0.89. There's a very strong linear association. At this point, I just don't know yet if it's positive or negative. I could probably speculate, but let's cross that bridge when I get there. Okay, so we have got everything done for the first two tables from the Excel output. Let's take a break here. I'll come back with another video and we will go through this third table of obtaining our estimated coefficients for our estimated equation. And then we can look at how we can do some of the testing and what those intervals mean. Then I'll probably do a third video for that third part C because that can also be a little bit time consuming. Okay. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope this was helpful. Take care. Bye-bye.